In this last video on semi-empirical molecular orbital theory, I'm going to try to bring you uh, all the way up to the present and talk about the nature of parametrization, uh, the philosophy behind parametrization, and finally a, a little bit about uh, modern usage. So to some extent, semi-empirical theory is not used much in modern modeling. There are a few places where it finds utility, and I'll, I'll try to at least provide one example. But it's quite helpful in providing a better understanding, I think, of the physics of molecular orbital theory when one delves carefully into what the various integrals really mean instead of it all looking like an uh, uninterpretable mathematical exercise, an impenetrable mathematical exercise. Hopefully, if nothing else, you take away from this a better feeling of how the integrals represent certain physical quantities and why they appear in the formulations that we've seen so far. Well, I'd like to start, though, with a bit of history. And I would like to talk about two big personalities uh, in computational chemistry in general, but in particular, uh, who uh, were renowned within the field of semi-empirical molecular orbital theory. Each of these two individuals, John Popel, shown on the left, and Michael Dewar, shown on the right, were uh, British chemists originally, and each of them moved from the United Kingdom to the United States. So John Popel came to Carnegie Mellon University, where he spent most of his professional career, and then ultimately he was an emeritus faculty member at Northwestern until his death a few years ago. He was uh, recognized with the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, in part because of his contributions to theoretical chemistry, not, interestingly enough, to semi-empirical molecular orbital theory. We'll have a little more to say maybe about Popel's contributions to ab initio and uh, post hartree fock models, but in any case, a Nobel laureate uh, who shared the Nobel Prize with Walter Cohn, for, who won it for density functional theory, which is another item that we'll be discussing later. Michael Dewar uh, was, I believe, Sir Robert Robinson was his research advisor. He was an organic chemist, but a physical organic chemist and one who thought deeply about the physics underpinning organic structure and reactivity. And he moved to the United States to uh, the University of Texas at Austin and spent most of his professional career there. there and he uh, subsequently retired to Florida and uh, passed away several years ago. These two differed in many respects. Popel was a physical chemist. He originally uh, began his work looking at NMR spectroscopy, as a matter of fact, before becoming a, a theorist in, in toto. Uh, Dewar did a lot of theoretical work, but as I mentioned, was a organic background. And so, to some extent, they had a different take on what you would use semi-empirical molecular orbital theory for. So Popel appreciated it and made most of the developments that I've described to you, by the way. So Popel did foundational work on CNDO, on INDO, on uh, NDDO, and really kind of developed the models. And it was Dewar to, to his credit, appreciated to some extent how the models could be made more useful for practicing chemists. So to a physical chemist, the NDDO model was something that had utility as an approximation, but you would tweak it differently for every individual problem you might like to study. Right? It was a model that could be massaged and used, and then you would put that on a shelf somewhere, and you would massage it in a different way for the next problem you might want to apply it to. Dewar, on the other hand, was one of the early people to recognize that if theory was going to be widely adopted and useful to the, to the broader community, it had to be a little bit more black box in character. That is, you would have a single model that was designed to be robust in terms of its application to many different chemical problems. And of course, the problems he cared most about were organic chemistry problems. Now, these two men differed in other respects as well. Popel was... If you were to describe his personality, uh, one would be reasonably accurate to say he was reserved. He was relatively tall, thin, ascetic, might be a little bit too strong. Certainly he, he got more cheerful after he won the Nobel Prize. But he was, uh, maybe he was sort of a typical physical chemist at the risk of creating stereotypes. Dewar, by contrast, was considerably shorter a bit, uh, a bit stout, perhaps, rotund, might not be too strong, and 
very much a combative in sort of the classic uh, warrior organic chemistry style. As long as we're indulging in stereotypes, we may as well go all the way. And so Dewar was quite the in-your-face sort of chemist. And uh, if you were to read through some of his articles in the literature, you would find that he was unsparing in his criticism of those he took for fools, and that constituted about 90% of the community. Uh, so there are many wars in which Dewar engaged, and we don't have to dwell on all of them. Uh, some he won and some he failed to win, but he was never less than enthusiastic in combat. And so there's a fascinating tale of a Gordon conference many years ago. I was not at that Gordon conference, sadly, but uh, at that particular Gordon conference, there was a session where Popel and Dewar were invited to speak uh, to the same audience as part of the same session. And this is quite typical of Gordon conferences. Uh, there's this idea that you want to get together people who, it'll be like some gladiator thing, bread and circuses, and see who's left standing at the end. Uh, often it's a little bit more reserved, but in this particular case, so for those who don't know Gordon conferences, uh, they're a little different now than they used to be years ago, but many of them retain the following flavor. They tend to be held at small boarding schools in New England, and these schools, lacking any means to make income during the summer when their students are all at home, will rent out their facilities. Of course, as they don't have to serve their students who pay ridiculously high tuitions uh, during the summer, they see little point in, for instance, air conditioning their facilities during the summer. And so you'll have these uh, senior chemists sharing these little tiny dormitory rooms with uh, you know, the temperature at night being 90 degrees, uh, and there's maybe a window fan that you can take advantage of. It's, it's a camping experience for scientists is a way to think about it. And they cover many, many topics, but in any case, this would have been a theoretical chemistry conference. Well, apparently at this particular session, the temperature in the auditorium was indeed somewhere north of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And so Popel, in a very Popelesque way, gave a thoughtful, detailed lecture that uh, he was cool as a cucumber, he probably had a tie and looked just, uh, you know, smashing. And then Dewar, who came on uh, feeling somewhat attacked, Dewar always felt a bit under attack because he didn't think people appreciated his chemical intuition as it added value to theory, because the theorists were going on and on nattering about getting the right answer for the right reason, as opposed to just getting the right answer, which Dewar thought was actually a reasonably valuable thing. You know, if you make billions for your stockholders, that's not a bad thing, whether you had your uh, theoretical purity or not. So uh, he sort of jumped up and began launching into his presentation, and because it was quite hot and he was carrying a few extra pounds, there was a puddle around him by the end of the presentation, and he sort of collapsed into a chair uh, next to the, uh, the, the overhead projector or the slide projector, whatever they were using at that point. And I really wish I had been there, because it sounds like it was a spectacular piece of chemical history, but I've only heard it reported to me. I, I did uh, meet Michael Dewar, uh, and of course I also met John Popel, who uh, was around longer than Dewar, and certainly his personality came through everywhere. I saw him on a panel discussion once where he managed to cause the eyes of every single other member of the panel to roll at one point or another, which I certainly found highly amusing. I was a young, young chemist at the time. To include Bill Jorgensen, who's very hard to perturb, but uh, Jorgensen gave a full-fledged eye roll to one of Dewar's comments. So these two personalities brought a lot to theoretical chemistry, and it was fascinating to uh, see how the science developed as a result of their contributions. So let me tell you what Dewar really did that turned NDDO theory from sort of an interesting step along the way to doing more complete Hartree-Fock calculations, and that is that Dewar recognized that the deficiencies in the theory by the time you finally got to NDDO largely had to do with the nuclear repulsion term. That is, you had finally gotten to a stage where the quality of the electron, electron, and electron nuclear and uh, kinetic energy interactions, it really wasn't bad. All that was needed was to change the nuclear repulsion term. So here's how you would usually compute nuclear repulsion, right? ZA times ZB divided by RAB. And if this looks funny to you, that it isn't, it says ZA times ZB times SA, SA, SB, SB electron repulsion integral. But remember that in NDDO theory, you evaluate this integral as a point charge interacting with a point charge divided by the distance between them. So this is 1 times 1 over RAB, 
So this really is the correct nuclear repulsion of ZAZB over RAB. So if you see that, you've really captured an appreciation for NDDO theory. And if you don't see it, stare at it until you do. But then Dewar added this somewhat funny looking term. And what does this term say? It says, I'm going to continue to recognize that I've got these nuclei with different charges and a distance between them, but I'm now going to multiply by a sum over up to four Gaussian functions. So this is a Gaussian. It's got a prefactor. It's an exponential of minus something to a squared power. And so these little a's, b's, and c's are parameters. And depending on those parameters, it creates either an attractive or repulsive Gaussian function that will be centered at some distance between atoms A and B, and this parameter tells you about that distance. It will disappear more or less quickly, depending on the magnitude of this parameter B, and it will contribute more or less, depending on the amplitude of this parameter A. And I'll have separate parameters for separate atoms, so there's, some, there's a little a, little b, little c for atom A, and there's a little a, little b, little c for atom B. And effectively what this does, as I put it here, is it just puts some Gaussian ripples into the potential energy surface. So if you discover that your NDDO theory, for instance, has four-membered rings, uh, cyclobutanes, insufficiently puckered, then you would create a little attractive Gaussian at the distance between the two methylenes that approach each other in the pucker, and that would help to pull them a little bit closer together. And if you discover some other systematic error that involves uh, geometry, you'll add a repulsive or a attractive Gaussian that fixes it up. If you like, it is an ad hoc molecular mechanics way, so there's no electronic structure here, these are just, you know, attractive, repulsive, non-bonded terms is a way to think about it, uh, uh, overlay on the potential energy surface that adjusts systematic errors. Now subsequently, and much more recently, uh, Bill Jorgensen and co-workers have taken this idea and they have uh, refined it a little bit, and they called it a pairwise distance-directed Gaussian approach, PDDG, and so you will see certain semi-empirical models like MNDO. So that was Dewar's modified neglect of differential overlap, MNDO. And PM3, parameterized model 3, we'll see that in a moment. So this model is actually in use today, and Jorgensen and co-workers use it as do some others uh, in order to do calculations. But I want to come to another personality. So here's Dewar again, still the same Dewar. And this is Jimmy Stewart. So Jimmy Stewart was... Another person from the UK, actually, although his uh, degree was from Scotland, and he ultimately came to the United States as well, and he worked with Dewar in the early stages of Dewar's development of NDDO models. And so Dewar's first NDDO model was called MNDO, Modified Neglect of Differential Overlap, modified because he introduced these additional terms, uh, he made it work in a general way, and Stewart assisted with that. A subsequent model that was created in Austin, so A is Austin Model 1. So this was entirely developed while Dewar was at UT, and Stewart was involved in that development as well. And after uh, the end of his postdoc, Jimmy Stewart went to Seiler Labs, that's at the United States Air Force Academy, where he was a staff scientist, and he went on to develop a model called PM3. So that stands for Parameterized Model 3. So MNDO was the first parameterized model, AM1 was the Austin Model 1, but it was the Parameterized Model 2, is how Dewar, uh, sorry, Stewart thought of it, and PM3 was the third parameterized model. Now, I mentioned that Dewar was never shy about combat, so it turns out that if there were one person on Earth that Michael Dewar perhaps despised more than John Popel, it might have been Jimmy Stewart. And uh, that was sort of a sad situation that derived from certain uh, misunderstandings and perhaps uh, scientific pride. And I'm actually going to hold Jimmy blameless, if only because Jimmy is still with us, so I may as well speak ill only of the dead as opposed to the living. But in fact, uh, part of the, the problems that arose between them were a difference in philosophy and also a difference in uh, understanding of intellectual property, perhaps. So the 
Other thing that Dewar recognized, besides the idea that you would need a black box in order to get organic chemists to use a theoretical model widely and benefit from it, he recognized that that black box had better be in code that would be uh, easy to use and distributable. And so, in fact, he created AMPAC. Uh, so that was a computer code that ran these semi-empirical models. And I think A, again, was Austin, and I think maybe it was Austin Molecular Orbital Package. I've actually forgotten, but that's, that might well be correct. So AMPAC. However, if you were to ask who wrote AMPAC, it was almost entirely Stewart while he was actually a postdoc in Dewar's labs. And so uh, Jimmy felt that he had a pretty substantial ownership in AMPAC, and when he went to Seiler Labs, he continued to develop the code, and I, I don't know whether there had ever been an agreement between the two or not. I've never really asked. But at some point, he released a code he called MOPAC, Molecular Orbital Package, which was built on the routines he himself had, for the most part, written, and included this additional new model, PM3. So that did not endear him to Dewar. But the other issue was more a fundamental scientific issue. And so what I show up here, this is something we've seen in the context of molecular mechanics. If you want to choose parameters, you usually make reference to some sort of error function. That is, you have some large set of observables which will occur with some frequency. Uh, for example, these might be bond links would be an observable, or ionization potentials, or uh, dipole moments, you name it. You're going to have some set of things that you're going to want to try to match. And for each of those things, you'll have a number of different occurrences. You might have 29 dipole moments, 463 carbon-carbon bonds, whatever. And in every case, you'll compare your computed value to the experimental value. You'll weight it in some way that makes this all unitless. So you have to decide tenth of an angstrom in a bond length. Is that like 10 kcals in a heat of formation? Is it like 2 to buy in a dipole moment? Those are all bigger numbers than you'd ever use. But just to indicate that the weighting function is your choice as a chemist for deciding how you want your error function to evolve. And you want to minimize this function. And so Dewar's approach to doing that was very much a hands-on, organic chemist at the wheel approach. You would look at the data, you would immerse yourself in the data, you'd think carefully about why one molecule was different from another molecule, you would tweak the parameters, and you would finish when you, with your godlike intuition, were satisfied. And that's, you know, Dewar's approach, and he was quite convinced he had that godlike intuition. Stewart had come from a, a physical chemistry background and had a much more uh, almost statistics level approach to it. And his belief was there are very sophisticated applied mathematical algorithms that permit you to minimize an error function. So why not harness all the computer power available at the Air Force labs at the time and simply by you know, brute force using these algorithms, drive the error function down as low as possible and call those the parameters. So AM1 followed the Dewar approach to parameterization. PM3 followed the Stewart approach to parameterization. And once PM3 was published, there uh, was a long exchange of fire between Austin and uh, wherever Jimmy was. He subsequently left Seiler Labs. But uh, of Dewar essentially publishing papers saying, look how lousy PM3 does for this particular problem while AM1 is wonderful. And then Stewart replying uh, and saying, actually, PM3 does quite well for this thing and AM1 is not quite as good. I would say after years and years of experience. So here is a, an example of a comparison. This is just taken out of the textbook. And these data are a little old. You can find more modern comparisons. But it gives you a feel for what's going on. So the first generation model, these are the heats of formation for a bunch of molecules. So these numbers are how many molecules. Were the, were the molecules made from lighter elements? Were they made from heavier elements? How many were there? CH, include nitrogen, include nitrogen and oxygen. Toss in some fluorines as well, maybe some radicals. And what you'll discover is the very first generation model, the modified neglect of differential overlap, it had some pretty large errors. AM1 was a significant improvement. But the improvement was almost entirely in tweaking those Gaussians, the me molecular mechanics overlay, if you will, that fixed up nuclear repulsion. And uh, it was certainly non-trivial, but you see these errors of, mm, you know, these are mean errors, so you're plus or minus 5 to 7 kcals per mole in heats of formation on organic molecules. And it's not a terribly systematic error. That's just intrinsic to the semi-empirical approximation. And if you look at PM3, 
Sure enough, it did drive many of these errors down. It goes up a little bit for uh, CHN molecules, but otherwise there's better performance. And in addition, working for uh, a military laboratory, uh, Stuart was quite interested in certain hypervalent compounds, and so he looked at uh, sulfur and phosphorus in hypervalent situations and was able, through adjustment of parameters, to significantly improve uh, heats of formation of hypervalent molecules. And so you see this is, this is still a large error, but by comparison to AM1, it's an enormous improvement. Of course, part of the trouble with hypervalent molecules is if you restrict yourself to S and P valence type functions as a basis set, you run into issues. If you add D functions, so this is a modern development to include D functions in the basis set, and it was Walter Thiel who also originally uh, began his semi-empirical work with Dewar as a postdoc, and is now running a Max Planck Institute in, in Germany. So Thiel investigated adding D orbitals to the basis set, and you see that now you do very well indeed on hypervalent compounds, and in general you can have significant improvements when you have heavier elements around, so not, not too surprising necessarily. So all that being said, when you go back and you look at certain features of PM3 molecular orbitals, for instance, you actually discover that AM1 enjoys certain... Uh, higher levels of intuitive accuracy. So a good example is when you look at partial atomic charges of nitrogen atoms in amines, just to, to pick one example. Uh, PM3 gives simply ridiculous charges, essentially, whereas AM1 gives kind of these sensible, yes, sure enough, you know, nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so uh, you'll have a minus nitrogen and a positive hydrogen attached to it, and that's not necessarily the case in PM3. So that's an example where just letting the statistics run where they will might have taken one to an unphysical minimum in parameter space that was dictated by the error function. So to some extent, you could say that Dewar imposed a... Uh, and, hmm, an appendix to the error function that was called the doer satisfaction function, and he minimized the sum of the two, whereas Stewart was willing just to go with the error function. All right, well, that's enough history, I suppose, although uh, we have included a little bit of adding d orbitals and what that effect is. Let me mention one area where semi-empirical theory continues to be used, and uh, I don't have a slide for it, but I'll mention a different area just very briefly now, and that is you know, the virtue of semi-empirical molecular orbital theory is its speed. So you can do a pretty big molecule nowadays with density functional theory, with uh, even with post hartree fock methods, all of which we're getting to later in this course. But if I need to do a million molecules, because, for instance, I have a pharmaceutical database and I would like to compute certain properties for every molecule in that database that I think I may be able to use in structure-activity relationships, well, I may find semi-empirical theory to be the only practical way to carry out those one million calculations. And so it's, you know, really big databases or particularly big molecules and lots of them where you may be willing to accept that you're going to have reduced accuracy, but at least you'll have some numbers to work with and they're likely to be better than just random guesses. But a more modern approach, which is also relatively interesting, is to say, is to kind of step back from the Dewar philosophy to the Popel philosophy and say, I don't want a black box mo model that's going to be applicable to everything. Instead, I would like a fast model that will be tuned to one thing. And so uh, Don Trular here at the University of Minnesota first suggested calling this an SRP model, which stood for specific range parameters or specific reaction parameters, it's also been used to mean. And that means over a reasonably narrow range of topics, perhaps you can find better parameters. So let's say that you are interested in this potential atmospheric reaction, hydrogen atom interacting with methanol and abstracting a hydrogen atom to make this radical, which you know, might have atmospheric implications. And in order to study the dynamics of this process, you intend to allow a hydrogen atom to come zooming in and you'll follow the dynamics of it bashing into methanol and does it abstract the hydrogen, does it not abstract the hydrogen, you'll, you'll just watch it. And so you need a way to compute the potential energy and the forces and integrate Newton's equations of motion and you're going to do that for many trajectories. So that's a lot of calculations. You want a speedy model and it certainly may well be that uh, semi-empirical molecular orbital theory is going to hence be a, a useful choice because you want to do this for thousands of trajectories. So how might you go about modifying? So here's 
here are some of the key parameters in the AM1 model. So earlier I asked you to try jotting down the sorts of things that are written in stone. And here are some of them. So there's the ionization potential of an S orbital on a carbon atom, of a P orbital on a carbon atom, the beta, the resonance integral for an S orbital on a carbon atom, and for a P. And the same things except for oxygen. These are the AM1 parameters. These are what were optimized by Michael Dewar in conjunction with his co-workers. And if you ask for certain things, how do these default parameters do for the energy change for the reaction shown here? Well, experimentally, the energy change is minus 5.1 kcals per mole. And sorry, I don't have units on this slide, but these are kcals. And AM1 says it's minus 28 kcals per mole. So that's a pretty big error. AM1 makes this reaction substantially too exothermic. Why is that? Well, uh, one reason is if you look at the dissociation energy of the CH bond, so now we'll just break a CH bond in methanol, AM1 says it costs 81 kcals per mole to do that. But experiment says it costs 104.4 kcals per mole. So that's why this reaction is too exothermic for the most part. It has too weak a CH bond. If you look at the forming HH bond, experiment's 109.5, AM1 gets 109.4, and perhaps you won't be surprised to hear that the bond strength of molecular hydrogen was part of the parameterization process. So it does very well. So what one does in an SRP model is looking at sort of these kinds of critical data. How can I tweak these parameters in order to improve against experiment and hence have a model that's really specifically appropriate for this reaction? And these are the SRP parameters that were developed. And you note that there's really very little change, for instance, in the beta parameters for oxygen. There's a little more change in the beta parameters for carbon. Uh, very little change in these parameters as well for oxygen, but a, a relatively substantial change, although it's, it's less than 10%, in the U.S. parameter on carbon. And so that serves in this SRP model to make the CH bond strength greater. That's what was needed to agree better with experiment, and now the thermochemistry is about right. So here's a model that you can now use and consider to be far more trustworthy to study the dynamics of this process. All right, well, this actually completes the, uh, the range of topics I want to cover with semi-empirical molecular orbital theory. When next we return to lecture videos, we will look at sacrificing the semi-empirical approximations and really solving Hartree-Fock theory in all its glory in order to do things from first principles, so-called ab initio Hartree-Fock theory.